Let me do the got it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, we are so thankful for the book of Jude that gives us warnings. Mm -hmm. It tells about the, the, the end of those who have um, so condemned, I should say, uh, uh, ha those who have uh, misled the saints. And uh, I pray that as Mike unfolds this this book to us, five verses five to nineteen, they're all loaded, and it's all about you, Jesus, because you are the final Adam, the eternal Adam, and in you we put our trust. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, we'll start by my reading the book. It's always nice to be able to read the entire book before you through before you start going uh, talking about what it means. Okay, the letter of Jude, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, beloved. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perish in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late, late, in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment <clears throat> on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, 
malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, world devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Man, you just want to say amen and pack up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Already are. Yeah, I guess you know, Pam pointed out that some of you already are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Remember these verses, these this whole section, verses five through nineteen, is divided into five sections. Uh, and each one of these sections, he's making a reference to an ancient text, whether it's Old Testament writing or uh, Jewish traditional writing or apostolic writing. He's making reference to an ancient text, and he follows that up immediately by applying it to uh, these <clears throat> false teachers, these uh, interlopers, these... Um, uh, ungodly intruders, and uh, um, the effect of this, what, he, what he's doing in doing that is going into detail about their character uh, and their condemnation, but the effect of it, the effect that it's supposed to have is to expose for his readers the danger that these false teachers are uh, and emphasize in their minds the need to contend for the faith and to remove those false teachers from their fellowship. Um, that's the effect that it's supposed to have. That's why he's doing this. I mean, he could have just skipped from verses three and four to verse 20 and tell you how to contend for the faith. But he wanted to drill down on the danger, and he wanted to make it. He wanted to make clear two things, two things, that God uh, is able to protect His people all through these battles with false teachers, much less the arch enemy. Um, he's able to keep his people from stumbling. And at the same time, he is able to uh, reserve these enemies of God for judgment, bringing them uh, into final judgment. He's able to save his people and judge his enemies. He's able to do that. And so, um, to expose the danger, and at the same time, to emphasize those two things. He's able to keep his enemies for judgment. He's able to keep his people from falling. It encourages us. It provides great encouragement to us as we get into verses 20 to 23, when he explains how to contend for the faith. So it's some, it's a, um, Harsh reading at times, those verses, 
but they serve a very important point. Okay, so we finished that first section. We got we started the second session. We got section verses nine and ten. We got through verse nine. And so we are ready for verse 10. Just let me read verses 9 and 10. So the example is taken. Uh, first of all, the example is prompted by that first example when he talked about these false teachers um, uh, slandering the glorious ones. That, that prompted the second example. And this second example uh, in verse nine is refers to Genesis six one through four. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it refers to the burial of Moses, uh, but he goes to the assumption, the tr Jewish traditional writing, the assumption of Moses that. Uh, um, explains what happened uh, when Moses uh, was buried. So <clears throat> remember we said that Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 12 records the death of Moses, but it but not this incident that Jude records in verse 9. He got that from uh, Jewish tradition uh, that the devil argued um, with uh, Michael the archangel over the body and it was um, um, a legal argument um, the devil was saying look Moses <clears throat> murdered uh, and so his body belongs to me. Do you remember, do you have any idea what the devil would be referring to there about Moses being a murderer? Yeah, when he caught the Egyptian and murdered him. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then ran off into the desert for four yep. years. Yep, mm he -hmm. uh, stopped the Egyptian taskmaster from beating uh, his kinfolk and uh, when, when he struck him, it killed him. Um, so that's what, the, it was a legal argument. Mos I mean, uh, the devil was wrong uh, about his assertion, um, but the example that Jude is drawing on is even though, um, Michael was right. He did not assume the authority uh, of his own to make a charge against the devil, but rather appealed to the Lord's authority. The Lord rebuke you. In other words, he knew it wasn't his place to act uh, as judge there and to pronounce this judgment on the devil uh, or, or pronounce or, or uh, charge him with this blasphemy. Uh, so he appealed to the, Lord, to the Lord's authority. And so Jude's point is if Michael declined to make a charge that was clearly correct, how much more restraint should humans exercise in making judgments against angelic beings they barely understand. Anybody here understand an angelic being? <laughs> I sure don't. We read about in Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Paul re refers to ranks of angels, rulers, authorities, principalities, powers. Anybody understand those ranks, what they refer to, how they're organized, what they do. Uh, Daniel and Daniel 10 refers to roles of angels. Um, uh, the angel that was sent uh, to explain to Daniel the 
prophecy of 70 weeks and he didn't and and he was um uh held up by the prince of of persia referring to uh a demon there that was uh trying to influence the king of persia and he referred he said how michael the prince of israel the guardian and 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 warrior for israel came and helped him anybody understand what's going on behind the scenes there i mean there's when you stop and lay out some of these things that the that the bible um uh, just gives us glimpses about angels. It's like there's a whole lot going on there we don't understand. Um, and um, Jude says that doesn't bother these false teachers in the least. And so, um, verse 10 applies this example um, to the false teachers so uh, top of page four there those are the these are the new notes you got the new pages were pages four through six just as in the previous section jews jude used the word these to apply the example in verse nine to the false teachers and and jude's charge here in verse 10 is twofold first they blaspheme what they do not understand. Um, we talked about this before in the book of Jude um, in verses um, three or four, I forget which, or six, I can't remember. Earlier in the book of Jude, we talked about the word blaspheme, and then it's that he is using it in the sense of slander or reviling. Reviling is, a, is to revile is abusive speech um and uh and the phrase uh all that they do and do not understand refers at least to angels because that's the context right they in verse eight we we're, were told that they slander the glorious ones and then we get this example the the false teachers are compared um to michael in his dispute with the devil so um at the very least when he says they blaspheme what they don't understand he's at least saying they speak abusively abusively about um uh angels but it, but uh all that they do not understand probably includes more than just angels probably includes other spiritual matters i mean uh clearly in um verse four they don't understand the gospel and the grace of god they alter the grace of god to make it an uh um something they can use to satisfy their sensual immoral um desires so that's the first thing that jude charges with them that they blaspheme what they do not understand and then he says they are destroyed by all that they understand instinctively what does that mean well this word destroy uh this greek word for destroyed means just to destroy to ruin even to corrupt uh and it probably does refer it's more likely that it does refer to corruption rather than destruction um and so i think what he's saying here is that they are corrupted uh uh by their immoral practices you can somebody want to read Ephesians 4:22. This is an example of that word that's translated destroyed being used in that way. Ephesians 4 22. Put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life 
and his corrupt deceitful desires. So I think that's uh, what he's saying. That's the way he's using the word there. Uh, but um, so what that what that means um, is that they are driven. Well, he goes on to say before I say what uh, put it all together. He goes on to say uh, that they um, are corrupted by uh, what they understand instinctively. Okay, now, in that word for instinctively um, would be used uh, like animal instincts. Uh, but I think what he's using it here for is uh, the sinful desires of their nature because fallen man is enslaved to his sinful desires. We can't change those sinful desires. Um, God's the only one that can change those sinful desires. That's what the Holy Spirit does at salvation through the washing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit in Titus 3. Um, so uh, what he's saying here when he says that they are destroyed by all that they understand it instinctively is their lives are ruined or corrupted uh, um, because they are being driven by the desires that flow from their fallen nature. So like irrational or to use George, uh, Jude's word, unreasoning animals, they are driven by their sinful instincts rather than understanding and reason. Okay. These are, these are pretty harsh charges against the false teachers. That was a really harsh charge in the day to be told that you don't understand in the sense that you are ignorant, you lack knowledge. Uh, and then to be told that you're being driven by instincts instead of by reason, uh, that was doubly harsh. And that's what Jude is saying about these um, false teachers. Think about it. Michael, in his battle with the with the devil he was he was restrained he understood uh appointed spheres that god had given to various angels and various beings uh he understood what was going on there he understood the devil was lying and he knew that it wasn't his authority to pronounce judgment on the devil so he restrained himself and he uh, said the lord rebuke you but that's not the way these false teachers operate they just charge right in uh and and they arrogantly blaspheme or arrogantly slander things they they don't even have any understanding and as a matter of fact they're just being driven by their instinctual uh sinful desires their instinctive sinful desires so the emphasis in this section is on the arrogant immoral character of these false teachers but there is there is the implication here that uh the same judgment that falls on the devil will fall on these false teachers too. The Lord will rebuke them. Um, so, you know, that, that certainly, um, that exposes the character of these false teachers. 
I imagine these believers, uh, uh, some or many of them, get uh, some glimpses of that kind of character in these false teachers that snuck into the church. But it, when we get down to verses 20 to 23 on how to contend for the faith, you know, this is also an example for us. Michael is also an example for us. Uh, the restraint that he showed uh, and the deference to the Lord's authority. Um, so we'll we'll talk more about that when we get to verses 20 to to 23 then he brings up his third this this uh third section here um verses 11 through 13 moral testament examples and and if you're wondering um why didn't he just list all the old testament examples first i think what's going on here i think what's going on here is those first three Old Testament examples in verses five through seven, that was examples of uh, patterns in the Old Testament. This person sinned and no matter how important or uh, what a big shot this person was, they were judged. No matter what a privileged position they had, they were judged. Like Israel, just... Uh, redeemed out of Egypt. What a privileged position they were in. They were the apple of the Lord's eye. And yet he judged immediately after delivering them out of Egypt. He judged them in the desert. He judged the unbelievers. <laughs> Here in this section, these Old Testament examples, they're examples of notorious sinners that wielded all kinds of influence over others. And we'll see that in a minute. And doesn't that sound like the description that Jude's been giving us of these false teachers? Um, let's, let's read these, these uh, verses. So again, the example is in verse uh, 11, and then verse 12 and 13, he adds extra application to them. Uh, verses 11 through 13. Woe to them, for they walked uh, in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and the way of, and uh, perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for e forever. Okay. So, uh, in this third section, Jude reminds the, his readers of the Old Testament stories of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Each story is a well-known incident, and one of the things that draws these three together is the way in which they influenced others. And we'll see that as we go through this. But Jude changes a little bit. He does not wait to apply these examples to the heretics as he did in the first two sections. He pronounces a woe oracle, announcement of judgment. That's what a woe oracle is. So when he's saying woe, uh, where is verse 11? Woe to them. That, that is called a woe, and then he goes and pronounces the judgment. That is called a woe oracle and just simply means an announcement of judgment. Okay. Um, but he, uh, in bringing up these examples, he pronounces 
he gives an announcement of judgment on these false teachers. So he draws a direct line just right off the bat from these notorious exam uh, these notorious sinners in the Old Testament right to the false pro uh, teachers. But he doesn't run out of application because in 12, verses 12 through 13, he, he delves more into the character of these um, uh, notorious sinners. So anyway, um, first he says they walked in the way of Cain. Now, we know the story of Cain and Abel, right? Uh, Cain killed his brother Abel after the Lord rejected his offering, but accepted Abel's. It shouldn't be his Abel's. It just should be Abel's. Um, and, and you can read that incident in uh, first eight verses of chapter Genesis 4. God punished Cain by making him a fugitive. Remember that? He drove him from the land of Eden and uh, and and Genesis 4 says that he settled in the land of Nod. Now, in the Jewish literature, the way they uh, they the way they talk about it and the way they go through these incident this incident with with Cain, they um, Cain is regarded as the original, pattern or model of a sinner now i know adam and eve already sinned right they sinned in the garden were driven out of the garden but uh because but remember god god uh made sacrifice for them that is he killed an animal and and clothed them with the skins and the implication there is that Adam and Eve continued to walk with God. Uh, but here we have Cain um, uh, not giving acceptable sacrifice, getting hating his brother Abel so much because Abel's uh, sacrifice got accepted that he killed him. Uh, and God warned him before he killed his brother. Remember that? First eight verses of Genesis 4, God came to him and warned him and told him, if you offer an acceptable sacrifice, it'll be, you know, if you offer the right sacrifice, it'll be accepted by me. Uh, so God warned him, but he went ahead uh, and killed his brother. So in the Jewish uh, interpretations of these, of Genesis 4, Cain became the original model or sinner uh, of a sinner, uh, a model or pattern of a sinner. And he's also also remembered for leading people into wickedness. Um, you can read in the Jewish leader uh, literature, and they talk about his vice, his immorality, his lust, his and and uh, and especially about him leading others into wickedness. Uh, I don't know that it may have to do with uh, uh, after verse sixteen in Genesis four, verses seventeen to the end of the chapter, we read about the development of this society uh, from Cain outside the presence of God. So uh, that may have a bearing on them seeing Cain as one who leads others into wickedness. Of course, in the New Testament, he's known as the one who murdered uh, Abel. And he's also an exemplar of the hatred that leads to murder. Somebody read 1 John 3 12. We should not be like Cain, 
who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Yeah. So um, uh, it was his hatred of his brother that led him to murder uh, his brother. Um, and so that's that's the first example he gives. They walked in the way of pain. That that is, um, uh, they oh, that that is they followed his example. Then the second, and and they themselves, these false teachers themselves. Uh, the very nature of what they do, creeping into a church, infiltrating a church, and um, integrating themselves into the life of that church to take advantage of the unsuspecting. Uh, they are very harmful because of the way that they influence believers. So that's that's the key point there. Um, and so the second example is they abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir. Do you remember what Balaam's heir was? This takes some, a little bit of piecing together in the Old Testament. Balaam's there is he just didn't know the donkey spoke. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was God's grace. <laughs> God enabled the donkey to speak to keep Balaam from being killed by the angel that was standing in the way. <laughs> J. Vernon McGee used to say that uh, Balaam lived in a day when donkeys spoke, only he used the biblical word, and we live in a day when they won't keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds exactly like J. Vernon sure McGee. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what we what we saw, I mean, what probably is very familiar to everybody um, is in Numbers 22, 23, and 24, um, Israel getting ready to enter the promised land, and the king of Moab, Balak, sees the massive size of Israel and knows uh, what they've already done. And um, is afraid of him. And so he hires Balaam to curse Israel. And that should tell us something immediately about Balaam. He was a prophet for hire. He, um, and what, uh, what the Jewish interpreters of that text said, he practiced divination, which is probably true. Um, so that much is probably pretty pretty familiar with everybody. Balak attempted to curse Israel, but failed each time. Uh, and uh, you know he had already accepted Balak's money, and he tried cursing Israel, but failed. But then we read in chapter twenty five that the Midianite women enticed the Israelites into adultery and uh, idolatry, and God slew them. God judged them, the Israelites. It's not until chapter 31, verse 16, that we're told that they did that at Baalim's suggestion. So the way it happened 
was Balaam, the prophet for hire, the greedy one, the one who's given himself over to greed, uh, um, is approached by Balak, and sure, he wants all that money. So he accepts Balak's money, but God intercedes each time and, and, and makes him bless Israel and predict the coming of Messiah each time. And, you know, obviously King Balak, the king of Moab, uh, King Balak uh, isn't appreciative of that. And, and Balaam tells him, I told you I was only going to be able to say what the Lord let me say. And he said, but then what he did there, chapter 25, and we find out in 3116, it was Balaam who did it. What, he says, but here's a workaround. Here's how you can get them in trouble with their own God. Send your women among them or invite them down and have your women entice them into adultery and idolatry. And so uh, uh, King Balak and the Moabites followed Balaam's advice. And that's exactly what happened. I think it was like over 26,000 Israelites were killed or something like that. I can't, I'd have to go back and read it. Uh, but God judged them. Um, uh, so um, in the Jewish writings about this story and their commentaries and interpretations of this whole incident with Balaam, Balaam became known as a false teacher. Uh, he was a famous false teacher um, who led people into sin. So you're picking up on this pattern. Cain uh, was the uh, original model of pattern for a sinner, and he led people into wickedness. Balaam was uh, a model or uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of a false teacher. He became known as a false teacher who leads the people into sin. So keep that pattern in mind. The third, they perished in Korah's rebellion. Now, Korah was a Levite, a cousin of Moses, he was appointed to the service of the tabernacle. Uh, but uh, as the Jewish interpreters of this passage uh, add, he became dissatisfied with his position and aspired to the dignity of the priesthood. Uh, so if you go into number 16 and you read about this, incident you see how he uh uh was jealous of Aaron Moses's and Aaron's position and he led a rebellion against their leadership um he accused Moses and Aaron of exalting themselves above the people uh, of Israel and he accused them of lying to the nation uh, about leading them to a luxurious land, the promised land. Um, and, uh, and we all know what happened, right? What happened? The ground opened up and swallowed up him and his family. And, and yeah, everybody connected to him. This judgment of Korah and everyone connected to him in Numbers 13 uh, really stood out in the Old Testament. It's the only example of this. And the way the Jewish interpreters write about it, they say that they were they went straight down into Sheol. Mm -hmm. Straight down. Um, so it wouldn't be like an earthquake or something. It would just be something totally different. Yeah, God just opened up the land. 
mm. the earth underneath them. Mm. And everybody connected with Korah, his family, his followers, 250 in all, uh, um, were swallowed up by the earth. Mm. And so uh, they were taken directly into Sheol. Um, and so they point to um, the, the, the judgment that fell on Korah and his followers. They point to that uh, and talk about what a notorious sinner he was and the way that he influenced people to the extent that God opened the earth and just took him down to shield and all of those with him directly. Um, now, in the Jewish tradition, Korah uh, also altered some of the Old Testament law regarding the garments worn by the Levites. That You could tell a, a priest from a Levite by the garment that they wore. And he he didn't like that. Again, remember, he he was dissatisfied with being a Levite and wanted to be uh, a priest. Now, the priests were also Levites, but out of the tribe of Levites, only some of them were priests. And obviously, the high priesthood went through Aaron's line. Aaron was a a Levite. Moses was a Levite. Both of them, they were sons of Levi. They were, they were um, uh, descendants of Levi. And, um, uh, but you could tell, you can make, a, you can see the distinction between a Levite and a priest by their garments. And, and uh, in Jewish tradition, Korah altered some of the law um, regarding the garments worn by the Levites. Uh, and so he became the classic example of a lawless heretic. So look at this. Think of this. Korah uh, was, um, was altered the God's law and rebelled against the God's authority. And altering God's law and rebelling against his authority is Jude's precise charge against the false teachers in Jude 4, right? They change the grace of God. They alter the grace of God into sensuality, and they deny their Lord and Master. So that's what he's charging the, um, the uh, false teachers with in verse Four and here in these three notorious sinners that he that he uh, um, points out to them, he reminds them of all three of them: Cain, Baal, and Korah. Um, they were uh, they were models because of the type of sin they did and the influence it had on people. They were models of notorious sinners uh, and influencers of people for wickedness. Now, uh, and the way, the order in which he puts them, Cain, Balaam, Korah, he's emphasizing Korah. Because if you put it in chronological order, it would be Cain, Korah, Balaam. But he lifted, he didn't put it in out in chronological order. He put Korah at the climax. And uh, most think he did that because um, uh, Jude was emphasizing uh, the similarity between these four these false teachers and Korah. Korah altered the law and denied the authority of God. These false teachers altered the grace of God in the gospel and denied Christ, their Lord and master. 
So Cain, Balaam, Korah were notorious sinners who, according to Jewish interpretation of these biblical stories of Cain, Balaam, <laughs> and uh, Korah, influenced others in their own error, in their own sin, in their own wickedness. And this is most likely why Jude grouped these three together. Uh, and his aim, certainly, certainly he wanted the false teachers to get this. Certainly he hoped that, um, that uh, it might give these false teachers something to pause about. But that wasn't his ultimate his aim. His ultimate aim were those believers that were being influenced by these false teachers. His aim was to persuade his readers to reject the intruder's ways, oppose their teachings, and remove them from their fellowship. Any questions on those three examples? Okay, then in verses 12 through 13, he, uh, in his application, uh, lists six vivid images that portray the character of these false teachers and the harm they inflict. So he would have said these same things about Cain, Balaam, and Korah. He... Um, uh, he started off by pronouncing judgment, uh, an oracle of judgment on these false teachers because they're just like Cain, Balaam, and uh, Korah. And so then in his application, he's drilling down on uh, their character and, and the harm that they inflict. So six, six uh, uh, images here. Hidden reefs and shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds, fruitless trees in late autumn, wild waves of the sea, wanderings and wandering stars. So We'll go through as many as we can get through here. <laughs> um, he calls them hidden reefs. They are hidden reefs at your love's, love feasts as they feast with you without fear. That's what he says, uh, first of all, in verse 12. Now, we're not going to read through uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. But you can go home and read that. What remember, Paul? He's correcting them about um, their communion time, their their celebration of the Lord's Supper, and he's saying that the rich are getting drunk and and stuffed, and the poor have nothing. He says. What? Don't you have homes you can eat your meals in? So that may that may sound kind of strange to us, uh, leading up to a, uh, a discussion of what uh, the Lord's table is all about. But uh, in the first century church, they had these love feasts, and uh, when they got together, they they were called love feasts. Uh, agape feasts because they were supposed to be characterized by love uh, and clearly in first corinthians 11 those those verses there they the love was kind of missing um but um the uh lord's supper was celebrated uh at the end of these love feasts and you can see how this started because remember do you remember how jesus instituted the Lord's Supper? You remember the context of that, of his institution of the Love Supper? What were they doing? 
They were having a meal. They were they were feasting. Yes, they were having their Passover meal, mm -hmm. the Passover feast. And there's four cups that they share, uh, four cups of wine that they share in the course of that meal. And Jesus, when he came to the third cup in that meal, the cup of joy, he used that cup to institute the Lord's Supper. So, so you can see why it would be fairly straightforward that they would have a meal when they gathered together and in the course of that meal celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so when you read 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, what you're reading is Paul correcting their abuse of that love feast. And he's telling them, if this is the way you can, you're going to handle it, eat your meals at home. Just celebrate the Lord's Supper when you're together and eat your meals at home, which is eventually what the church did. <laughs> Um, but anyway, this is what's going on in the church, not the abuse of the, uh, of these feasts. I'm not saying that, but he's saying, Jude is saying these, these false teachers are integrating themselves into the church through these love feasts. That, that's one, that's one of the ways in which they're integrating themselves into the church mm -hmm. is participating in these love feasts. Uh, feasting and banqueting was uh, an important social activity back, uh, back then, back in that society. And so they're, they're cozying up to believers and getting to know believers and, 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 um, developing relationships uh, and feeling people out uh, and all of that in their love feasts. And so he's saying, these guys are hidden reefs in your love feasts. Um, these uh, false the, uh, teachers feasted alongside the believers without concern for their sinful lives or the harm that they bring upon others the false teachers that is they didn't care how sinful they were remember in first corinthians 11 uh in paul's correction he talks about toward the end there he talks about not uh um taking the lord's supper in an unworthy manner well that's precisely what the false teachers were doing, but they didn't care. They did it without concern about uh, their sinfulness or the harm that they're doing to anybody else there. So just like hidden reeves, these false teachers' treachery lie just below the surface and destroy the unsuspecting. That's the I, they might not have cared then, but they care now. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Then I guess we're going to have to stop with the second one. We'll finish them uh, next week. He says also you know, next week's Christmas. Oh yeah, that's right. That's that's right. The next two weeks we're not going to meet because oh, we yeah, got Christmas. Christmas and New Year's. So the uh, second Sunday in January, which would be January 8th, I guess, uh, we'll meet again. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, um, they are shepherds feeding themselves. Shepherds was a common metaphor in the Old Testament for leaders. Uh, they called kings shepherds. David was called a shepherd. Um, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he laid down his life for his sheep. And then after his resurrection and ascension, Jesus appointed under shepherds to care uh, for his people under Christ's authority. You can read about that in 1 Peter 5, the first five verses. These false teachers were only interested 
and exploiting the sheep for their own benefit. Okay. And we're out of time. Uh, uh, but you can read these on your own and we'll hit them real quick uh, on January 8th when we resume class. Um, but it's, it's a description of spiritual barrenness and unfruitfulness and, and harm inflicted on those who are unsuspecting. That's, that's uh, he's using those vivid images to really drill that down in their heads. Uh, okay. So, Pam, would you like to close us in prayer? Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the warnings that you give to us in your word so that uh, we don't uh, walk into things unsuspecting. Mm -hmm. And Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ and that we can get together uh, with them to uh, study your word together. And we thank you most of all that you're right here with us, whether in this office here at church or uh, in the homes of the other folks that have joined us here, you're right there with each one of us. And we're so grateful for that. Yes, Father, we pray that, uh, that these next couple of weeks uh, in which we won't be meeting, um, but that are uh, special, uh, special days that, that we celebrate as, uh, as a, a people. We pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to remember your son and what he's done for us, and that we would be careful not to get so caught up in all the busyness uh, that we uh, forget about uh, him and that he, that what he did for us is what we're celebrating at this time. Yes. So Father, uh, we thank you and we love you and we ask you to uh, take care, good care of us. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll turn off the recording and then we can talk. <laughs>